This is CBC Here and Now. Missing and murdered women and girls remembered. I'm Katie Breen and I'll take you to the In Her Name vigil. That's ahead. New developments involving the main contractor's work at the Muskrat Falls project. Astaldi says it's incurring extra costs and is in talks with Nalcor. This as the company is accused of not paying its bills. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. And I'm Debbie Cooper. We have breaking news tonight about the Muskrat Falls project. Astaldi, the main contractor working there, has faced a series of financial problems. And questions about how those problems could affect work needed to finish the Labrador mega project. Now Astaldi has broken its silence. Here and Now's Rob Antle is in the newsroom tonight with the latest. So Rob, what have you found out? Well, we began asking Astaldi for comment last week, and this afternoon we finally heard back. Astaldi says it's incurred extra costs for doing its work in Labrador and is now in discussions with Nalcor. Work to finish the generation site here at Muskrat Falls is winding down, but suppliers have been getting wound up, saying Astaldi is behind on its bills. They filed liens totaling $34 million, claiming that Astaldi owes cash for everything from steel to concrete to food and cleaning materials. Last week, Astaldi's parent company in Italy filed for a type of protection from its creditors, sparking concerns over what that might mean here. But Astaldi hasn't commented on the situation in Labrador until now. This afternoon, a media contact in Italy sent this email to CBC News. The Canadian operations of Astaldi are independent and do not fall under the credit composition process Astaldi has filed in Italy. Therefore, the intent is to pay all outstanding amounts to creditors in due course. We are also in talks with our client to reach an agreement on extra cost recently incurred during the performance of our works. Astaldi won't say how much money is involved in those talks with Nalcor, but says it remains committed to completing the project with the cooperation and assistance of Nalcor. Now, Nalcor isn't commenting on those talks, only saying at this point that it continues to pay Astaldi under the terms of the contract that's currently in place. Reporting live in the newsroom, I'm Rob Antle for Here and Now. There's still no official word from DJ Composites that it has agreed to binding arbitration with the locked out union in Gander. Unifor brought in a couple of hundred people this week to join the picket line. It says it will remove those people once DJ Composites puts its willingness to go to binding arbitration in writing. The company locked out Gander workers 21 months ago. Unifor and Premier Dwight Ball are saying both sides have agreed to it. Ball says he had spoken with both sides and tried to move the talks along. He's not saying what prompted the company to finally agree. We're very pleased. I was as speaking to both that I think there is a resolution here. And this is really about the employees that have been out uh, of work now, locked out for some 654 days, I guess, today. So, uh, you know, we're hopeful now. Bonding arbitration is a mechanism that will bring this to a close and we can get people back to work and we can get this company making components right here in Gander. We see thousands of people every summer here, and uh, people that have been coming here for years. The alpaca farm in Felix Cove is no more. The alpacas have been sold, and the business is closing. We'll talk to the owners. Lawyers for the Crown and Defence gave their closing statements this afternoon in the case of a man charged with trying to drug and kill his wife. But as Here and Now's Ryan Cook reports, the jury is not dealing with a straightforward case. It's a disturbing allegation that Mark Rumble tried to drug his wife twice in one night, attempted murder. But the defense is calling into question exactly who drugged who. The prosecution says Mark Rumbolt poured a bath for his wife one night last year and then gave her wine and sangria laced with sleeping pills and Ativan. But defense lawyer Jeff Bray says it was Rumbolt's wife who laced his drinks. During the trial, a 911 call showed it was the wife who called for help, saying her husband was on the verge of overdosing on Ativan. First responders found both of them unresponsive. Later at St. Clair's, a nurse said she found Rumbolt with his hand over his wife's mouth 
and Ativan residue on her lips. Brace says the evidence showed there was a bag of Ativan torn up under the sheets of her hospital bed and that a nurse testified she had to pry her mouth open to see the drug residue. Brace believes this is evidence that she tried to kill herself after trying to poison her husband, an assertion that the Crown says is utterly ridiculous. But that's all for a jury to decide now. Ryan Cook, CBC News, St. John's. Quebec's Inu chief left the Muskrat Falls inquiry today without testifying, and he leveled harsh criticism because Inu translation services were not arranged for his testimony. Jean-Charles Piatichot is bilingual, speaking both Inu and French. The inquiry didn't have an Inu translator there today and believed he would testify in French using a French-English translator. But when he began speaking, he spoke in Inu, then switched to French and through a translator explained that he did not feel respected. <laughs> So let's, Je let's me sens pas respecté ici. I do not feel respected here. Okay. All right. Je me sens pas bien ici. I do not feel good here. Parce qu'on respecte pas ma langue, ma vie, ma culture. My language, my life, my culture are not being respected. Je sens, j'aurais aimé parler dans ma langue. I would have liked to speak my language. La langue seconde, qui est le français, n'est pas ma langue. My second language, French, is not my language. Right. Et ce que je vais exprimer ici n'aura pas le chemin qui vient de mon cœur. What I'm going to say here will not uh, come from my heart. Inquiry Commissioner Richard LeBlanc offered an apology before Piat de Show left. LeBlanc also offered to delay the chief's testimony until Inu translation services are available. There's a vigil being held in St. John's tonight called In Her Name. The annual event honors missing and murdered women and girls who have connections to this province. Their names will be read out one by one. Here now's Katie Breen will be there to hear them. Katie, how many more names were added this year? 20. One new case, Victoria Head, who died last year, and then 19 historic. Women and girls who were just left out of our history. Joining me now is Amelia Reimer. She's one of the organizers with today's event. And Amelia, how is it that some of these women and girls were left out, forgotten about? Some of it is a lack of good records being kept. Uh, some of them predate being able to Google search or anything like that, so we have to look more obscure places. Um, part of it is family shame and small community shame, not wanting to talk about uh, these losses and to admit that things like this really do happen in Newfoundland and Labrador. And in total tonight there will be 138 names. What is it, what do you make of that number? It's, it's astonishing. It's, it's really hard to fathom. Uh, I'm heartbroken over it and every time we work with these names each year we feel almost haunted by the names. What does it mean to say them one by one? It's it's very powerful and moving and it helps to acknowledge each of those individual lives that we're honoring as a and we're trying to have a different person read each card to help convey that message as well. How will exactly it work? Um, each person will, who's, who's signed up to read a card will come up and read off the name, the age, uh, when it happened, where it was to, and then a small description of what happened. And now there's a connection with violence and these deaths. Mm -hmm. What is it that you would like to see done to, to make these, this list stop growing? We need more supports for women who are trying to leave abusive situations. Um, we also need to be teaching men how to be helpful and nonviolent men to stand up and be part of the solution and not just be bystanders. Amelia Reimer is an organizer with the event tonight. She works with uh, the St. John's Native Friendship Center. And of course, this it's just about to get underway it at 6.30. That's when things will get going. And we'll come back and check in on the event. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Katie Breen in St. John's. Them, it was really starting anew, starting fresh. Um, you know, most of their family was wiped out um, in the Holocaust. 
Renovations this week at a downtown St. John's business unearthed a little known part of Holocaust history. Just ahead, Chris O'Neill Yates explains the history of the Furmans. <laughs> That's the very enthusiastic French immersion students from Vanier Elementary. You got to get high mom in there. <laughs> the grade fours and fives came by bright and early this morning for a tour of our set, uh, the ever popular green screen there. Oh yeah. And they came along with their teachers, Ms. Hudson and Mr. Sevier. Yes, lots and lots of energy in the room there this morning. Lots of enthusiasm. Thanks so much for visiting us. It was a lot of fun, actually. I yeah. wasn't here for that, but I get, it looks like it was a lot of fun. <laughs> they definitely got a kick out of the green screen. <laughs> <laughs> we have another uh, uh, visual to show you. Uh, if you were on the Avalon yesterday, you might have caught this. It's an incredible double ring around the sun. Wow. And then a rainbow on the side. Yeah, there it is right there. It's kind of difficult to see. Uh, Daryl Benson sent me this video on Twitter. He says it was taken in Mount Pearl on Topsail Road. And I actually saw a lot of photos uh, online yesterday of this same optical phenomenon. So it was seen by quite a few people yesterday. Apparently it had something to do with uh, ice crystals. Striking. So it is very much so.
Yeah, I didn't see it though, did you? No, no, no. no but <laughs> I've seen a whole lot of rainbows as we all have been seeing, but yeah. not that one, it would have been good. Yeah. So we're getting so close to the weekend. Uh, we have to just get through to tomorrow and uh, tomorrow morning actually looking pretty mild in the east. Mm -hmm. Things are gonna cool down though as the day uh, goes on. Uh, let's have a look at uh, the highs today. Just check out some of these temperatures in the west. Corner Brook got up to 18, Deer Lake, Stephenville 16. So some nice mild temperatures on the island. Happy Valley Goose Bay even got up to uh, 16 degrees today. So some cool air and rain coming through Labrador tonight. So this will be pushing through from west to east. Behind that some really cold air, a chance of uh, some flurries. Lab City looking at a wind chill of minus 14 overnight tonight. So it's going to be very cold there. You can see early tomorrow morning. This is about 3 a.m. Lots of showers on the west coast and along the south coast of the island, but that will move off as the day goes on. So overnight tonight, we're looking at about five to 10 millimeters of rain for the St. Anthony area, and it's going to be really windy along uh, the northeast coast gusts up to 70. They're also windy in the wreck house area. We're looking at gusts up to 70 there as well. The Corner Brook area and along the west coast looking at about 10 to 15 millimeters of rain overnight tonight. Not so much as you head east, uh, an overnight low of 11 degrees in St. John's 13 in Grand Falls, Windsor. So it's going to be pretty mild overnight on the island tonight. Not so much in Labrador. Labrador, though, as I mentioned, a wind chill of minus 14 in Lab City there with a chance of showers overnight tonight. Five millimeters uh, in Happy Valley Goose Bay, 10 to 15 along the straight. So it's going to be very wet and very windy in those areas. We're looking at gusts as well up to uh, 70 along the coast tonight. So as we get into tomorrow, we have this wind warning in effect. As high as the winds will be tonight, they're going to get even higher uh, tomorrow in these areas from Nain down to Rigolette along the coast there. So this is how it's all going to play out. You can see the strong westerly wind pushing across Labrador. Those showers pretty early in the day on the west coast start to move off. So we're here at 8 a.m. and things are already clearing in the Corner Brook area in the Northern Peninsula. So you're going to go from rain to sun and cloud pretty quickly in the morning. Similar story for central areas, but the east we're looking at a mainly cloudy day uh, with some showers throughout the day there. But as we get into the evening hours, things are going to start to clear off. So to, to start the day tomorrow morning, if you're in St. John's, we're looking at 17 degrees because we're in this nice southerly wind, 30 gusting to 50. But as the day goes on, temperatures are going to drop. So by the time we get to the afternoon, we're looking at a chance of showers there in 11 degrees. And then when we get into the evening hours, mostly overcast skies and nine degrees. So we're switching from that southerly to a northerly wind, really dropping the temperatures down. So yes, we do see 18 degrees as the high there tomorrow, but that's really for the morning in the afternoon. It's going to be cooler, so make sure you take your coat when you leave the house. As we head into central, a very similar story there. It's going to be fairly mild in the morning, but temperatures steadily dropping throughout the day. A chance of showers there, but mostly clearing as you head into the afternoon and a mix of sun and cloud for the west coast as well. Much cooler there. Lots of sunshine along the straits, but some cloudier skies for Labrador and a chance of some flurries in Lab City. Zero uh, for Labrador City tomorrow as the high. So a bit later, I'll get into uh, the weekend forecast. So far, it's looking pretty good. Lots of sunshine in the forecast. I'll have the details a bit later. Debbie. Thanks, Carolyn. Renovations at a sandwich shop in St. John's have opened the door to a little known part of Holocaust history. Workers uncovered a sign for a clothing store owned by Jewish refugees. They left Newfoundland decades ago, but thanks to a post on social media, an important part of their story has been saved. Here now is Chris O'Neill Yates has more. This is the sign that's caused such a stir. Lewis Furman and Company, buried under decades of development. It's an amazing story about the power of social media. Someone had tweeted out a photograph and just said, who, who was Lewis Furman? Folklorist Dale Jarvis knew immediately and raced to the rescue. In time to find that the sign had been cut up into pieces and uh, was about to be shoveled into a dumpster. Louis Furman and his wife Grunia met as resistance fighters in German-occupied Poland in the Second World War. Grunia a nurse and Louis a munitions expert. Nothing is impossible. 
a part of the famous Belsky resistance, immortalized in the Oscar-nominated movie Defiance, starring Daniel Craig. The group saved hundreds of Jews from concentration camps. In 1947, the Furmans arrived in St. John's and started a clothing store, says grandson Michael. For them, it was really starting anew, starting fresh. Um, you know, most of their family was wiped out um, in the Holocaust. Uh, my grandfather lost his first wife and uh, his, his child, and literally their family around them uh, uh, was wiped out. And the store became a gathering place for the entire community. Lewis, who spoke nine languages, often translated for Polish and Russian seamen who docked in St. John's. One of those Polish sailors sold Lewis this Torah, which he then donated to his local synagogue. Claire Frankel Salama met Lewis when she moved to St. John's 35 years ago. An interesting character. He uh, very firm in his, uh, his views. They were wonderful uh, to us, they, um, he and Grunia. Welcoming her into their small Jewish community. Their life had been pulled out, you know, from un under them, and uh, a lot of them didn't have a chance to finish the school, and that was what was open to them was, was business. There was nothing else. The Furmans expanded their business to two other towns. They retired in the 1980s and moved to Toronto to be near family. But grandson Michael says they carried Newfoundland with them right to their dying days. They had the opportunity to come to a community, to come to a city, a, a country that really put their arms around them uh, and welcomed them uh, like their own. Now the Provincial Museum plans to put the sign together. They'll use it in an exhibit they've been planning on Jewish families in the province. So we're really trying to uh, do this type of research right now. So it was great that this, this when we saw this, we're like, this is perfect. This makes great sense for it to come to the rooms. So it really is a, a, an interesting slice of uh, post-war St. John's history. Now recovered from obscurity. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, St. John's. That's fantastic that they saved it, and I understand it was really just by chance. Well, as Chris yeah. said, they had um, broken it up into pieces. It was almost in the dumpster, so I'm so glad that they were able to uh, salvage that. Yeah, an interesting mm. piece of history. Mm -hmm. Well, from St. John's to Labrador now, uh, she's played a big part in the making of the hit Broadway musical Come From Away, and now she's coming to CBC. Janice Gowdy will be the new host of CBC Radio's Labrador Morning, the morning show serving all of Labrador. Gowdy's been working as a journalist for almost 20 years across the country, but always found herself coming back to this province. Gowdy was part of the inspiration behind a character in the musical Come From Away. She was a new reporter in Gander on September 11, 2001, when thousands of passengers descended upon the region. The reporter character in the musical is based on two reporters working in Gander during that time. Gowdy is one of them. And Gowdy is uh, replacing Matt McCann and Bailey White, who moved to St. John's to new jobs earlier this summer. She starts on the air on October 22nd. And two other new faces are joining the Labrador team. Rebecca Martell is uh, moving to Happy Valley Goose Bay to be the show's new producer. She's worked as a journalist in the Northwest Territories and Quebec. And reporter Allison Sampson, who uh, many of you have seen on Here and Now, Many times as uh, she's joining the crew as a reporter. We see thousands of people every summer here and uh, people that have been coming here for years. The alpaca farm in Felix Cove is no more. The alpacas have been sold and the business is closing. We'll talk to the owners.
Land and Sea returns with a brand new season, beginning Sunday, October 14th. That's at noon on the island, 1130 in most of Labrador. Welcome back. Well, the famous alpacas are leaving the Port of Port Peninsula. After 20 years in business, the West Coast owners are selling their beloved animals and shutting down their business in Felix Cove. The quirky looking animals attracted thousands to the area each year. Here and now's Colleen Connors paid them one last visit. My name is Fleur de Lee. Claire's Clarenville, the black and white one. We've got Trinity. And the brown one is Bellevue. That's right. These long neck natives of Peru are all named after places in Newfoundland. This is one of the last feedings before the alpacas head to their new home, a farm in Central. They range between 9 and 17 years old. So some of them we've had an awful long time. And it will be difficult to look out and not see them. But we know they're going to really good homes, so um, that makes it okay. Every morning for 20 years, Kathy and Ed rolled out of bed to take care of the herd. This all started with one alpaca. That was September 1998. <laughs> when we first got them 20 years ago, um, nobody really knew anything about alpacas. We hadn't, we didn't know what they were, you know, up until a year before that because we had come across them, Eddie had come across them in a magazine. But we had one of the neighbors describe them as stuck up sheep <laughs> because of their long necks. The now retired RCMP officers thought the llama looking animals would be a good de-stressor to come home to. First there was one, then two, and after some alpaca affection, well, you know what happened. Now there's 40. All those alpacas make a lot of wool which makes a lot of woolies. But now, Kathy and Ed are all packing it in. <laughs> we're getting older. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we're not, we're not getting any younger. Getting We'd like older. to do uh, you know, some other things while we're still healthy. The couple want to travel, winter in Florida, and spend some time with the grandkids in Nova Scotia. They sold the alpacas, closed down the store, and their house is for sale. It's definitely going to hurt like it's gonna it, impact you know there's we see thousands of people every summer here and uh, people that have been coming here for years you know and now their children are coming you know the uh, so it's it's been a you know it's it's been a good road that we were on and uh, you know people really enjoyed it and uh, we enjoyed it the alpacas moved to their new home at a farm in central next week you know, we're still extremely attached and it's, uh, it's going to be very difficult to see that trailer leave um, and go back to an empty barn. But maybe there will be a bottle of champagne. And there might be. <laughs> <laughs> Colleen Connors, CBC News, Felix Cove. Oh, I'm sure they're, they will be misty-eyed. Yeah, no despite doubt. The champagne. <laughs> the champagne will help. Yeah. <laughs> so Land and Sea has an upcoming episode on Ed and Kathy, and that is set to air November 25th. Yes, it's called It's All Good, one couple's 20-year journey with Newfoundland and Labrador's very first alpaca firm. And do you have a story for us? If you do, please get in touch. You can email us at hereandnow.nl at cbc.ca or send us a message on Facebook or on Twitter at cbcnl. There are some new details in the investigation into an alleged serial killer in Toronto. The information coming from newly released police documents. The information gives insight into when police began linking all eight suspects to one alleged serial killer and when they began investigating the Toronto landscaper Bruce MacArthur. Those police documents also reveal what happened during a police search of MacArthur's apartment when he returned home unexpectedly. And that's where the CBC's John Lancaster picks up the story. It was a frantic one hour inside Bruce MacArthur's Thorncliffe Park apartment last December. 
Police had a search warrant to sneak into his home and clone the hard drive of his desktop. They were about halfway done when their fellow officers surveilling MacArthur sent word the suspect was on his way home. Police even skipped a search of MacArthur's cluttered closets, fearing their presence there might tip him they were on to him. The documents, still heavily redacted, were used by police to convince courts to give them production and search warrants, almost 90 in all. They show investigators had already spent years trying to determine who was behind a slew of disappearances from Toronto's gay village. Then in June 2017, Andrew Kinsman vanished. That was the tipping point. A search of Kinsman's home and computer revealed he and MacArthur had spent time together. There was a photo to prove it. Forensic evidence would surface as well. By November, police suspected MacArthur could be linked to the disappearances of other men as well. Police determined all of those missing men frequented the same bar in Toronto's gay village and all vanished during long weekends. That was important because MacArthur spent many hours at this midtown Toronto home working as a landscaper. Its owners often heading to cottage country on long weekends, leaving MacArthur alone on their property. John Lancaster, CBC News, Toronto. We return now to Waves of Change, a CBC series that dives into our plastic use and why we need to clean up our act. First, we take you to Prince Edward Island, where a summerside mom of five is blogging about what she's doing to cut back. Nancy Russell has that story. Rachel and Chris Wilcock have their hands full, literally these days. This is one-year-old Thomas, the youngest of their five children. They are part of what inspired Rachel to start the blog. The big household that we have, I just noticed that there's lots of garbage going out and I just decide that I want to start cutting back. She started the blog in mid-July and posts weekly what she's doing to reduce the family's use of plastic. One of the big successes has been starting to buy in bulk, using recycled containers that she takes to the store. I was talking to one cashier and she says I'm the only one that she sees that brings in so many containers. She uses washcloths instead of paper towels, a shampoo bar and soap that both come without any packaging. 
This is one of her own inventions, bags for produce, that she made out of an old curtain. All the small changes have added up. Say we went through maybe a, a bag of garbage a day out into the waste bin. Maybe it wasn't totally full. Um, so now I'm down to about one a week. Not everything has gone smoothly. An attempt to switch to cloth diapers is on hold after the liners she made gave Thomas a rash. And no alternative yet for potato chip bags and yogurt containers. Still, husband Chris is impressed. She's become my hero uh, on this because uh, it's so intimidating to think how can you like, save the planet. There's so much pressure on us to do that with our big family. Both of the Wilcox hope what Rachel is doing will inspire others and send a message to manufacturers. More things in bulk, less packaging. So that we can see more options which are earth friendly and climate friendly. Um, so Rachel and others just like Rachel won't have to try so hard to find alternatives. It does take a little bit more time. Um, but once, you, once you, you know what you're doing, you get into the rhythm of it, it it's worth it. Just a couple of months into her blog, and she says the learning curve will continue. Nancy Russell, CBC News, Summerside. Well, dentists recommend you get a new toothbrush every three months. And if you're listening to that advice, that means you throw away your old toothbrush just as often. And still with our Waves of Change series, Sabrina Fabian takes a look at another option, bamboo. Kate Pepler is putting the finishing touches on her zero waste shop, the first of its kind in Halifax. She suspects one of the hottest items will be these bamboo toothbrushes. Um, I've been using them for at least three years, I think. Um, definitely never going back to plastic toothbrushes, um, but so the whole thing is plant-based. The handle is made of bamboo and can go in the compost, but you have to remove the bristles first. With pliers, they come out pretty easily, so they're all grouped in little bundles, so you can just pop the, pull them out easily. So each little bundle individually? Yeah. So it's a little bit more time. A little bit more time consuming, yeah. The packaging is different than a traditional drugstore toothbrush as well. These brushes come in a cardboard box and a thin plastic wrapper. The box says the plastic wrap can be composted and the nylon bristles are recyclable. We brought the toothbrush to the city to see if that's really the case. It's not. This plastic wrap is definitely garbage and the top of this toothbrush is, is definitely garbage and typically the entire toothbrush would be garbage, but it, this is made out of wood, so it could go into the green bin. So in fact, the bristles are headed to the landfill because there's no market for used toothbrush bristles. And if any plastic wrap ends up in your green bin, it will be removed at the sorting facility. Our system doesn't take any compostable plastics. And one, it looks like plastic and will be pulled off uh, when we can pull it off. Two, it's compostable and biodegradable, typically under uh, lab conditions and not under real life conditions in a compost facility that produces 25,000 tons, or takes 25,000 tons of material uh, every year. And is this just as good as the one you get at the dentist's office? For the average patient, I didn't feel like it removed enough plaque. So Wendy like Stewart was given a bamboo toothbrush at a dental conference it? last fall. We generally recommend that you use products that have the American Dental Association seal. Which this one doesn't. This one doesn't at this point. I don't think a lot of research has been done on the bamboo toothbrush. While the bamboo toothbrush is a viable alternative to plastic, it isn't perfect. Environmental groups say it's really up to the federal government to set better standards. Sabrina Fabian, CBC News, Halifax. And remember, you can watch Here and Now while on the go. We're broadcasting live on YouTube. And you can also catch past episodes on demand. Just go to YouTube and subscribe to CBCNL. Well, here's a heads up for you. If you plan to order your holiday gifts online, you might want to hurry. There could be a postal strike as talks between Canada Post and its union stall. As CBC's Scott Peterson explains, the postal union is not finding much to cheer about in the company's latest offer. The postal union is telling its 50,000 members that the latest Canada Post offer, in a word, is unacceptable. This is directly in response to yesterday's offer, which included more money and increased job security. Here's what the Canadian Union of Postal Workers is telling its members that Canada Post 
has made some very small movements towards addressing our key priorities, but that there are many key issues missing and unacceptable proposals. The union goes on to say that the company's offer on job security, only guaranteeing work up to 12 hours per week, and a proposed raise of 1.5% are unacceptable. This puts the union and its 50,000 workers one step closer towards giving a 72-hour strike notice. It also puts Canada Post one step closer to a potential lockout. With the busy shopping and parcel season approaching, the corporation was hoping its four-year offer would be accepted. Clearly, timing is a bargaining chip for the union. A work stoppage could affect up to a million deliveries a day as we head into the busy holiday season. That's up about 20% in just one year. And all this could put a damper on consumer spending plans and Canadians' growing love affair with online shopping. Scott Peterson, CBC News, Toronto. Here's a live shot of the Prince Philip Parkway in St. John's, right on top of the CBC studio, getting pretty dark out there. You can see the lights over in the Munn building under construction. Uh, we do have some showers on the way uh, for St. John's tomorrow morning and some drizzle tonight. I'll get into that and your weekend forecast after the break. Okay, all right, topical songs. Taxes! So there's an, ah, I have to go away, go, uh, potholes, uh, pot, 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 yeah, pot. Hey, uh, what if we, uh, what if we just let the listeners decide? Sound good? Panting under pressure. Tomorrow on the St. John's Morning Show with me, Fred Hutton. And me, Chrissy Holmes. So this is the time we get a really good look at the long weekend mm -hmm. now. A lot of people making plans, whether they're staying in their home communities or hitting the road. Mm -hmm. Important to have 
good weather. It is and you know Saturday pretty no matter where you are in the province Saturday is looking very bright very sunny on the chilly side but uh, a really nice day and the whole weekend is looking pretty darn good. Let's start uh, with a look at tonight because we do have some rain coming through Labrador and also the west coast of the island overnight tonight. You can see the showers right along the west coast pretty heavy in Corner Brook 10 to 15 millimeters expected uh, there and right up along the coast through to the Straits. Looking at a very windy evening as well for the Rec House area with gusts up to 70 as well as the northeast coast in the Twillingate area. It's going to be pretty windy overnight tonight. About five millimeters of rain for the Cartwright area and uh, Lab City looking at uh, an overnight low of minus four. But uh, with the wind chill, it's going to feel more like uh, minus 14. So also looking at some pretty high winds, westerly winds gusting to 80 in Lab West and gusting to 70 along the coast. So all of Labrador overnight tonight will be very windy and that is going to ramp up even more tomorrow along the coast from Nain right down to Rigolet. We're looking at gusts up to 120 kilometers an hour, so it's going to be very windy there tomorrow. For the island, we're looking at those showers move off, move from west to east throughout the day. So if you're in the west, it's going to be rainy early in the morning, but then it's going to clear off very nicely as the day goes on. Similar story for central areas clearing off in the afternoon. St. John's looking at some uh, fairly heavy rain in the morning, about five millimeters, but then uh, as we get into later in the evening, that cloud should move away as well. And Labrador looking pretty clear, but uh, yeah, pretty chilly and pretty windy. So we're looking at 18 degrees to start the day in St. John's. It's not going to stay that way, unfortunately, but when you head out the door early in the morning, it's going to feel pretty mild, like 17, 18 degrees. But then by the time we get to lunchtime and supper time, the temperature is going to go down quite a bit as the winds switch from a southerly to a northerly. For Grand Falls, winds are a similar story. Not quite as warm to start the day, but temperatures kind of going down throughout the day. Cornerbrook looking at a high of eight degrees tomorrow with a mix of sun and cloud and those winds sort of easing uh, there along the coast. But for Labrador, there it is, the gusts up to 120 kilometers an hour for the Nain down through Rigolette area, uh, but windy everywhere. Westerly winds gusting to 80 for uh, the rest of the coast and as well for Lab West. Uh, pretty much everyone is going to get those high winds tomorrow and a chance of flurries and temperatures right around the freezing mark uh, for Lab City tomorrow. So Friday night into Saturday. This is nice. Just see this cloud is just going away. And then we're looking at mostly clear skies for everyone on Saturday. So yeah, it's going to be a nice crisp fall day temperatures still in the double digits in the uh, on the island in central and uh, the east 10 degrees as the high there nine for western Newfoundland mainly sunny day for the west and uh, three degrees there and as we head into uh, Saturday night into Sunday a little bit more cloud moves in you can see the system coming up through but uh, gonna affect a bit of the west coast and the northern peninsula but uh, the rest of the island looking at kind of a cloudy uh, day there so temperatures still around 10 11 degrees chance of hours for the west and a mix of sun and cloud for western Labrador and eastern Labrador. And uh, that's your forecast. Time now to uh, check back in with Here and Now's Katie Breen, who's at the Colonial Building tonight, where an annual vigil is being held for missing and murdered women and girls. Katie? Thanks, Carolyn. That's right. The vigil is underway now. About 200 people are here, and they're listening to the names of missing and murdered women and girls being read aloud. Let's join them and listen in. Mary was found badly beaten and strangled under a daybed. Ransom was on an ordinary backyard. Ethel Tucker, November 4th, 1950. Age 63. A total of 138 names will be read aloud tonight. Organizers say this vigil is about remembering those individuals, but also about reminding government that more needs to be done to stop this type of violence. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Katie Breen. Some high-profile celebrities are taking part in protests today against the U.S. Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh. At least two rallies are being held in Washington. 
A vote for Kavanaugh is a vote saying women don't matter. Yes. Let's stay together. Let's fight. Let's keep showing up. The big name protesters include Alicia Keys, Michael Stipe, John Legend, Lena Dunham, Amy Schumer, Maggie Gyllenhaal, and Whoopi Goldberg. And the U.S. Senate is expected to vote this Saturday on the nomination, but today Democrats and Republicans had very different takes on a new FBI report about Brett Kavanaugh. None of the allegations have been corroborated by the seventh FBI investigation. Not in the new FBI investigation, not anywhere. I disagree with Senator Grassley's statement that there was no hint of misconduct. Do you swear that if Brett Kavanaugh is confirmed to the Supreme Court, he would likely be a conservative voice on the court for decades to come. His accuser, Christine Blasey Ford, appeared on the cover of this week's Time magazine. A photographer in Nova Scotia is getting ready for his first show in decades. And the fact that it's happening at all is pretty remarkable. Christopher Porter traveled the world and photographed city life wherever he went. But 20 years ago, thousands of his precious negatives were lost. Colleen Jones has more on this developing story. In his office, Christopher Porter is going through old negatives he never expected to see again. 18 months ago, he got a call from someone saying they thought some of his work was in an old barn. When he got there, he found his boxes taken from his home two decades earlier, more than 100,000 negatives. And we found, uh, someone else found and called me and said, I think, you know, we found some of your work. And so we went and I've got photographs, a few photographs there just to let you know the kind of the scope of it. Hundreds of thousands of negatives and some very few images, but it did survive and that's kind of exciting. 18 months of sorting began. Hard? You bet. Oh my God, you have no idea. Some nights I had to stop. That board is ones I've looked at and you can see the, uh, the, empty, um, the empty pockets. After decades in an old barn, not all of his work could be saved. They burned some that were too scratched or wet. Now it's neatly organized. He soon found he had the makings for a show. It's called Urbania Part One, a collection where he tries to capture the soul of the city that he's visiting, from Casablanca to Istanbul. So my interest in a city is what makes a city feel, what, what's the, the heart, I guess, if you will. I know it sounds corny, but mm -hmm. so in every city this goes on and we ignore it, there's, there's usually walls, so we, we can't see it happening. And they, those are the people that make the city work. He hopes with one shot, like the old quote says, that a picture is worth a thousand words. What I do when I make photographs is I use a fixed lens and I go very close inside the image. I don't use a long lens and stand back. So I want to be inside it. And then it gives you a lot of depth of field. And it gives you the, it, it, there's, a, there's a taste of the environment. It's not a view, it's an involvement. <laughs> Two um, easels in here. With, with one on each. Yeah. Preparing for Friday's opening at the Lunenburg School for the Arts, he's both nervous and excited to see how his lost photography will be received. But he's relieved that what was lost has been found. Colleen Jones, CBC News, Lunenburg. Here's today's beautiful viewer photo of the day. And Debbie, do you know this was taken by a 10-year-old? Oh my goodness. Yeah. What a beautiful picture and what a good eye to capture it. So that's the reflection. It's just amazing. Yeah, really lovely. I'll tell you where in this province this was taken and who took the picture <laughs> after the break.
morning. Go time. Tune in to the St. John's Morning Show with Chrissy Holmes and Fred Hutton. Weekday mornings from 5.30 to 9. Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, if you thought rollerblading was hard, a woman in Montreal is making it even harder. Yes, she's trying to set a world record for rollerblading backwards in stilettos. <laughs> go! 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 Oh. <laughs> That does not look easy. Bianca Rosini has been working on her goal this week at a local stadium. She's trying to do 100 meters in 30 seconds, and yes, backwards. It's probably no surprise to learn that Rosini is a circus performer. Aha, that explains a lot. <laughs> yeah, I wonder where that idea came from, though. I'd like to know who made those for her. <laughs> All right, well, time now to get to our viewer photo of the day. And what a beautiful photo this is. Just have a look. Great uh, look at the, the sunshine reflecting off the water. This was taken in Loon Bay. And it was taken by uh, Callie Penny Smith, who is 10 years old. So thank you very much, Callie, for sending uh, that photo in. Uh, as Debbie said before the break, you have a very good eye. I wonder, did she take that on her phone or on a phone or a, hmm. an actual camera? The quality is excellent. It is. Great, Callie. Thank you for thinking of us. Yeah, and if anyone else has a, a photo, please send it in. Email it to nlphotos at cbc.ca. That'll do it for us. Thank you very much for being with us. Have a great night. See you back here tomorrow. Friday. <laughs> Good night. Good night. <laughs>